What I want to do today, and you might want to get out a pencil on this, I want to give you the reasons behind why I announced it now. Uh, and I'm going to give you 11 reasons, 11 reasons why I am announcing this now rather than later. If I don't get any of the other uh, questions answered, I really want you to be clear on this. And then I want to talk to you about what to expect in the days ahead, what you can expect that I know will happen in, in the days ahead. As you heard the message this weekend on, uh, on timing, I have learned that God's timing is, is as important in what we do as much as what we do, it's when we do it. And so over the years, I have learned to be increasingly sensitive uh, to the Holy Spirit's timing. And uh, I don't always get it right, but I can say this. I now believe I get it right more than I get it wrong, okay? Nobody gets it right all the time. But I do believe that uh, after walking with the Lord for 51 years and, and being at Saddleback 41 and a half years, uh, I get it right more than I don't uh, in, in timing. And so I want to give you 11 reasons why I decided to announce uh, the beginning of a search for my replacement now uh, and tell everybody about it now instead of like keeping it a secret for a while, okay? Here are, the, here are 11 reasons. Number one, I have always trusted the maturity uh, of our members. Uh, they have handled enormous change over 40 years with grace and wit and and, and charm and patience. Uh, uh, imagine somebody who was a member of this church when we had only 50 people. Or imagine somebody who was a member of this church when we only had 800 people or 2,000 people or whatever. The amount of change that the members of this church have gone through, uh, even in the last year, um, think of all the change you've gone through since you've been on staff. You know, this is a church that does not stand still. There are external changes like COVID, which was a, one of the biggest changes in our history, obviously. Uh, and there are internal changes. And there are the only thing that stays the same. The only thing that stays the same in, uh, at Saddleback Church is our commitment to the great commandment and the great commission. We are committed to Jesus Christ and we are committed to his five purposes. That has never changed in 42 years, but everything else has changed. The style of music has changed five times in the history of Saddleback Church. Staff is changed. I have over a thousand staff, former staff, who've been on staff at Saddleback Church, now serving elsewhere. I consider them like missionaries. As you know, I've got a, a, a Facebook page for former staff. Just because they're not here doesn't mean I don't love them. I do love them. I'm grateful for any time that they were here. Uh, but those people I care about doesn't mean they're serving here, but I still care about them and want to know about their kids and their families and stuff like that. But I, 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 the, our church has handled an enormous amount of change. So I knew that they could handle this one. And this is a big one. This is a big change. But I trust the maturity of our members. The second reason is I respect our members and I respect you. So I don't keep secrets. Okay. I wasn't going to keep it a secret. And then at the last minute, spring it on everybody. I trust you. I respect you. And so I'm not going to keep secrets from you. We are a family. We've said that all along. We act like a family. And you know what? Families share what they're going through. So if I'm going through a problem, I'm going to share it with you. If I'm going through a difficulty, I'm going to share it with you. If I'm going through having a tough time with my health, I'm going to share it with you. If I know God is leading me to move into the next stage of my life, I'm going to share it with you. I respect you. I, I trust your maturity like I trust the, the members' maturity. And I, I respect you, so I don't keep secrets. Okay? Uh, that's why from the very, very beginning, I wanted you guys involved. We haven't even started the search yet. Okay. We haven't even started it yet, but I'm telling you about it in advance. Okay. 
third reason of 11 reasons why now. I believe our staff is the healthiest it's ever been right now. I think that would be hard to refute. I believe our staff is the healthiest it's ever been. And that gives me great confidence uh, on making a transition in my own uh, life. Now, why is our staff the healthiest? You know who we have to thank for that? COVID. COVID and Zoom. And the racial issues that we went through this last year. Those three things, uh, not being able to meet together, uh, uh, dealing with something as serious as racial insensitivity, and then having the tool of Zoom, we have this, what we've got right now. Don't underestimate the power of this Zoom to build health, because for the first time in our history, all of our campuses can meet together. Prior to Zoom, we didn't have all the campuses and all of our staff able to be at staff meeting. They couldn't make every staff meeting. But we're, we're all, all the campuses are together. We have regularity, which builds fellowship. You know, when we remember when we started in COVID, we had a, we had a staff meeting every day. You remember at the start, staff meeting every day. Then we went to twice a week. And then we went to one once a week and we don't miss it. That has built the health of our staff. But more than just regularity on Zoom, we get to see each other's faces. And that's a big deal. You get to see body language of other people. You see, when we had staff meeting, like for instance, in the refinery at the Lake Forest campus, most of that staff meeting, you sat looking at the back of heads of people. You couldn't see their faces. You couldn't see their reactions. You could only see the back of their head. This Zoom actually works better than a, a, a together staff because you're looking at the back of the head most of the time and it's usually just a monologue. One person is talking and there's no chat. Chat has been uh, great. Uh, the very fact that we've been able to affirm each other as somebody was talking, you're able to go, that's a good point. And, and you bring up and we could ask questions and, and, uh, and then even at the end, when we would have a discussion, I could say, well, you know, uh, uh, Andrew, I saw you said this, or Megan, I saw you say that. Talk to us about that and bring it out. It actually, this tool actually increased fellowship, actually increased uh, us being able to hear from each other rather than simply hearing from one teacher or, or one speaker. So uh, the fact that first we, we got a tool that allowed us to meet every week allowed us to see each other face to face, allowed every campus to be involved, allowed us to react with chat, allowed us to talk, unmute and, and talk, allowed different people to pray and we could all pray with and pray for each other. Uh, these are all big issues, but do not underestimate all the time that we spent dealing with racial insensitivity. For many of us dealing and confronting uh, insensitivity, prejudice, uh, not being aware of how other people feel. Uh, that was a first time experience. And the gut level of those 17 hours in the first batch, and I think about 10 hours in the second batch, uh, when we were dealing with uh, Asian and Hispanic uh, issues. Uh, I don't know, honestly, I don't know any staff in America that probably had those kind of gut level discussions. The, the way we did, the way you did. I don't know, honestly, I say it without fear of being contradicted. Where would you find another staff where we were weeping with each other? Where we were saying, people were saying, I had no idea of the pain you were carrying. Where people spilled their guts, could lay their heads down on the table and weep. And the rest of us empathized and felt that that built a unity, built a harmony, built a, uh, uh, a connection that our staff had never had, okay? Very, very important. So the combination of COVID, not being able to see each other, the tool of Zoom, and then dealing with the mo a most fundamental issue, identity. Who am I? 
And race is a part of your identity, obviously a big part of your identity. And dealing with that and the, the camaraderie and the way we supported each other, the way you prayed for each other, uh, the way you owned up to your own insensitivity spoke volumes to me. And I just thought, these guys are further ahead than anybody I know, okay? Are we where we want to be in being an anti-racist church? Are we where we want to be as an all-nation congregation? Are we going to be, are we yet the model we want to be? No, nope, but guys, thank God we're not what we were. Okay, thank God we're not what we were. We're getting ready to where we're going to be. We've moved forward and, and there's no turning back. We're never turning back to insensitivity. We're, we're going to be a church that empathizes, not simply on racial issues, but on racial issues, on economic issues, uh, on poverty, on people in pain, on mental illness, on people struggling with all kinds of different issues. And that is, uh, it, it was a big, big thing that I think God was using that to prepare our church and to show me that our staff, I believe, I believe you are the healthiest uh, staff that we've ever had. And I praise you for that. We're not worthy. We're not worthy. We're not worthy. So I thank you guys. Thank you for being you. Okay. I'm proud of you. And uh, I, I trust your maturity and I, I respect you. Uh, number four, the fourth reason I did it now. I want everybody praying from the very start. If you don't know we're looking for the next senior pastor or lead pastor, how in the world can you pray for it? So I told you before we even started the search, because I know you can handle it, but I want you praying. This decision obviously is going to affect you. So why wouldn't I want you praying about it from the very start? That's a very, a fourth reason that's really important. And uh, anybody you can get else praying for it, go right ahead and get them praying too. And as I said, when you're ready to make a major decision, you don't want to just pray about it yourself. You want everybody else praying about it too. Number five, the fifth reason I decided now, we're not in a crisis. Okay. We're, we're not in a crisis. We're, we're not, you know, thanking the Lord in spite of the fact that, uh, you know, we didn't meet for over a year. Our finances stayed strong. Uh, we're, we're not in debt. We are, we are financially strong as well as spiritually strong. We're not in a crisis. We're not fighting some fire uh, uh, right now. I didn't want to announce this in reaction to any problem. Uh, it's summertime. We're about to come out of COVID. Uh, it looks like we're going to be able to very soon go without masks, uh, outside at least. And uh, that's a big deal. These are all positive things. So not being in a crisis, not reacting to, to some pain or something like that. I thought the Holy Spirit led me to go, this, Rick, is a good time. And, uh, and we're, we're coming out of, of, of a major uh, pandemic. Okay, number six, my own health is one of the 11 factors. It's not the only factors, but it is a factor. Uh, coming out of COVID, uh, I realized uh, that my thorn in the flesh that God gave me years and years ago, but long before Saddleback, uh, that it was getting worse. The degenerative disease, the spinal myoclonus, it's a rare version of spinal myoclonus. I went to, to uh, Mayo Clinic over 30 years ago, and they said, we may name a syndrome after you because it's, it's pretty rare. But the bottom line is, as I explained Sunday, when adrenaline hits my system, uh, that it, it, it creates a shaking, it tremors like Parkinson's. And now it doesn't happen when I'm moving. You see, most people won't understand because they've never seen it in me. It only happens when I'm trying to go to sleep, when I relax. And then when I relax, my body just starts shaking violently and it keeps me awake. And uh, many nights uh, a week, I'll be up all night. I have been living a sleep-deprived life most of my life. It doesn't show up when I'm speaking because I'm moving. And when I'm moving, that's releasing uh, adrenaline. 
But when you lay quiet and you lay silent and when you try to rest, like I can't take a nap. Uh, if you're able to take a nap, count your many blessings. In the afternoon, if you're able to take a nap, great. I'm not ever able to take a nap because if I lay down, my body will start shaking and it will start these, these tremors. And I, uh, uh, I think I told you that when I started the church, I thought, well, I could do one service because that raised your adrenaline one time, but I could never do two and then three, then four, then five, then six, and then even more. And my body has paid a tremendous toll uh, for preaching multiple services. We were only, the only time Saddleback was in single services were the first six months of the church. After six months, we went to double services and never went back. And it is a, it, it, it's been a drain on me. Well, when we did COVID, I was only preaching one message a week. And for a year, uh, I preached uh, uh, only one service a week. You know what happened? I started sleeping and I, I lost 40 pounds because when you sleep, you, you, when you don't sleep, you gain weight. I lost 40 pounds just because I wasn't, I was sleeping well. The moment we started services and back to four services on Sunday at Lake, Lake Forest, I just realized, oh my goodness, I didn't realize what that was like. And, uh, and I realized I'm not gonna be able to keep this up. And so there was a, my own uh, factor of my own health. Uh, that was number six. Number seven in the reason was the death of Glenn Cruen and John Baker and Rick Mutchow. Three of the founding pastors of Saddleback Church all died within six months of each other. That was not only a shock uh, to me, it was a wake up call that we didn't have any process in place that if something were suddenly to happen to me, if I got hit by a bus tomorrow, there was no process in place. There were no instructions, nothing in place to, to replace me. That friends was bad stewardship. That's bad planning. So while I'm not intending to get hit by a bus tomorrow, the bottom line is we needed a process in place. And I couldn't just keep on assuming that, oh, everybody will know what to do if all of a sudden God took me out of the picture as quickly as he took Glenn or John or Rick Muchow. So it, that was a factor. That was uh, the, the seventh factor in, in, in saying, we really have to have a plan in place. We don't know how long it's going to be, but we know we have to have a plan in place. Number eight, the eighth reason why I decided this was the time, but led of the Holy Spirit, is that I know that God has called me to lead the FTT Finishing the Task Coalition, that I am to be the spokesperson, uh, the, the face, the work will be done by 1,600 different agencies, and even more than that, churches, as we move toward the AD 2033 goal of a Bible, a believer, and a body of Christ in every unreached people group and every unreached place in the world. That's an enormous task. This last year, I was not able to do very much on FTT because I was preoccupied with, uh, with uh, the church, and particularly when I'm preaching uh, it involves uh, two days of preaching, two days of preparation, and a day of rest. That doesn't leave much left on that. But I know God wants me to lead FTT and has called me to do this. And it has been confirmed by Christian leaders uh, around the world that they were the ones who, who, who wanted me to lead it. And so uh, I, I know it's not like I'm going to be doing nothing, but it's over. Number nine, a ninth reason I knew this now. I know that there are books inside of me that God wants written that would require a sabbatical to write. And I didn't want to take a sabbatical this close to the end of my ministry. I just thought, well, you know, uh, take a sabbatical and then come back and, and, and retire or change jobs. Uh, that just didn't, doesn't seem right. Um, there are books in me that I have about six half-written books that I know that God wants to use as much as he used purpose-driven life. 
You know, with most of you know this, but some of you are new to staff. You don't know this. When I wrote Purpose Driven Life, uh, I took six and a half months off, almost seven months to write that book. And I would get up at about 4.30 in the morning uh, and I would uh, not shower or shave or eat breakfast. I put on some sweatpants and I would go to a little office behind the worship center uh, uh, back in the green room. And I would light a candle and I would just start typing. And I would type there uh, for hours until about noon. And then my uh, ADD would kick in and I go, I got to get with people. I've got to see somebody. I'm, I'm not, I'm a people person. And so David Sean or somebody on our staff would bring me lunch. Uh, I would eat lunch, walk around the Lake Forest campus, uh, take about an hour of break, shower there, and then start again about one o'clock and then type till about five, come home, play with the kids, eat dinner and get in bed. And I was in bed at about eight o'clock every night. And I did that for almost seven months to write that book. What Was it worth it? Uh, yes. Yes, it was worth it. Uh, during that time, during those seven months I was writing Purpose Driven Life, uh, I only preached two times, Christmas and Easter. Those were the only two services in seven months. So effectively, other people were leading the church. Now, while I was gone, from I didn't leave any staff meeting during that time. While I was gone, the, the church grew by 800 more people. And I thought, man, I should stay away more often. This is good. That was a sacrifice for me, and it was a sacrifice for the church. But it blessed the world. As you know now, Purpose Driven Life has passed 50 million copies in English. And who knows in how many of the other languages, how many millions it's done. I know 3 million in Spanish, but it's in you know dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of languages the most translated book except for the Bible. And so that was a good use of my time. But it did mean that, that I wasn't, wasn't leading the church. I can't write and, and lead at the same time. So that was another factor, is that I know that there are books in me that God wants written. Uh, one of the next one, one of them that I want to write is called The Hope, The Resurrection of Hope. And it's about hope, and it's about the 40 days after the resurrection. Um, so that's the ninth reason. The tenth reason why I decided this was the right time is because I made a public commitment at the first service uh, to give this church 40 years of my life. I have repeated that commitment hundreds and hundreds of times. Now, again, I said for all along, this was not a date that the Lord gave me. It wasn't God's promise to me. It was my promise to God. It was my promise to Saddleback Church. It was my covenant with the people there at the time. I'm not going to leave you. I will give you the best years of my life. I will give you 40 years of my life, and I won't be tempted to go away to lead a seminary or another church or lead a denomination or anything like that. I'm just going to stay here and, and focus. Um, so that... Uh, that, that when we came up to that year, we were actually a couple years before we hit the 20th anniversary, the 40th anniversary, Kay and I started praying. And we had already decided long before we hit the 40th anniversary, she and I had already decided that we were going to stay past the 40th year. We didn't see any reason to, but we just didn't, I didn't particularly feel like it was the right time, uh, that the timing was right. So we made a commitment a couple years before the 40th anniversary hit, we were going to go past the 40th year. Uh, but then during COVID, uh, I began to see clearer and clearer these reasons that I've already given you. And as we began to come out of COVID, they got to be clearer and clearer and clearer. And so uh, it wasn't like people didn't know that I hadn't made a 40-year commitment. We had made a 40-year commitment. And what was the surprise was that I stayed past it. I stayed past 40 years. We're now in our 42nd year. And we don't know how many more months or year or whatever it will take, but we're going to trust God's timing. Now, the 11th reason is this, and this is a big one. We are poised, Saddleback is poised right now for a new season of growth, a, a new season of growth. Uh, in September, for instance, at the Lake Forest, 
there, 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 first, let me just say this before I even talk about Lake Forest. There is a pent up demand right now coming out of COVID of people who are looking for spiritual roots. People got out of the habit of going to church um, in the last uh, year. Okay. Yeah. They got out of the habit, but there's also a hunger. And I was brought face to face with this a week ago when I was down at the San Diego campus, because when I was at the San Diego campus afterwards, I stood around and talked to people and over 20 people came up to me who told me I'm here for the first time. I'm here at Saddleback Church for the very first time, over 20 people. Every single one of those people said, what got my attention, what got me through COVID were the online services of Saddleback Church. I started watching online through the James series, or I started hearing it online through Daily Hope and the radio stations. And Daily Hope and the online services created a lot of people who were just waiting to come back to church once masks are gone and the threat is, is down. And as I said, over 20 people, every single one of them said, those Saddleback worship services, the messages and the music saved me during COVID, saved my sanity, gave me help, uh, gave me encouragement, kept me going. They were the bright spot in my week. And as soon as the service opened up, man, I made a beeline for that church. We are poised. We are poised, friends, for a next phase of growth this fall. I, I can feel it. I, believe me, I've been through a lot of different seasons in 42 years. We're getting ready for another season of growth. I can tell you right now, you can bank on it. Bank on it. We're poised for a new season of growth. Now, in September at the Lake Forest, we're going to open a new worship center. People think we're remodeling. It's not a remodel. It's a totally new worship center at, at Lake Forest campus. And it's going to um, attract people. In the history of our church, every time we move to a new location or every time we built a new building, we went up an average of 2,000 in attendance in one month. Every single time. When we open the new worship center at Lake Forest, there are gonna be, it, we'll do a big grand opening. There will be people who will come who've never been in church before. It just happens every time. We're poised for a new season of growth. Now, that was my 11th, but uh, let me give you a, a number 12. And I'm just throwing this in as a bonus, okay? And that is, we have been enriching the soil for 42 years. So fruit is inevitable. Fruit is inevitable. Someday I'm gonna write a book on the organic church, lessons I learned from gardening. And I've learned a lot of lessons about weeding and feeding and watering and planting and harvesting and all the different things that it takes. And most of what I learned about church growth, I probably learned in my garden. I told Kay the other day that the greatest uh, uh, reward to me of my garden each year, and if you saw my garden, it's, it's growing real good right now, uh, of all these different vegetables, over 40 different kinds of tomatoes I've planted and all kinds of vegetables and fruit. Uh, the greatest uh, benefit or blessing to me is not the annual harvest of fruit. It's the fact that I know that every year for over 20 years, I've been enriching that soil. And if you, in, that means that every year the soil gets richer, the soil gets richer, the soil, gets, which means the richer the soil, the more and bigger fruit you're going to have. For the last 41 and a half years, we've been bearing fruit, a very fruitful church. But my focus has been on enriching the soil. How do we enrich the soil? Through class 101, 201, 301, 401, through campaigns, which I will continue to write. I want to write some in the future that aren't we haven't done yet. Uh, campaigns, classes, 
cell groups, sermon series, enriching the soil. We have in our church right now a core, a solid core. You couldn't drive them away, okay? You just couldn't drive them away. And Sean wrote, are any watermelon, Kate? Okay? Yes, I am growing watermelon, Sean. I, I am growing watermelon, so there you go. Uh, bottom line is the soil of Saddleback is so rich, we're going to bear fruit no matter who's the senior pastor, no matter who is the, the, the lead pastor, because you are the enrichment of the soil. The members are the enriched soil. Uh, the, the bench strength that we have on our staff, the depth that we have on our staff uh, means whoever comes in as the lead pastor after me is gonna have an easier job uh, in some areas than I had because the soil is rich. There was no soil when I got here. When Kay got here, there was no soil. But we've been enriching that soil, building into people's lives for over four decades. And that is gonna to continue to bear fruit long past uh, my ministry and, and Kay's ministry. Now, oh my goodness, it's 148. Uh, I'm not getting to all your questions, but let, I, I need to ask you, tell you about what to expect, okay? I want you to write these things down because I know what's going to happen in, in the days ahead, and I just want you to be aware of it. When you're aware of it, you, you know, it doesn't scare you, okay? So here's what to expect as we begin the process of finding my replacement, finding my successor, however long it takes, Number one, expect mixed emotions, okay? Expect mixed emotions. I want you to be kind to the members because they and you are gonna have all kinds of mixed emotions. You might have some anxiety. Uh, you might have some grief. You might have maybe some fear, uh, some sadness, uh, some happiness for Kay and me. Uh, there could be a lot of different emotions that happen. Emotions are meant to be felt, okay? And so sympathize and empathize with everybody. When people are scared, work with them. When people are fearful or people are anxious, work with them. When people are sad or depressed or, or, or grieving, uh, a, another change. Nobody likes change, really. Uh, we like what we're comfortable with. Uh, but uh, our church has been through a lot of change, so expect uh, uh, mixed emotions. But here's the key. Trust the sovereignty of God. In, in the days ahead, trust the sovereignty of God. I want to remind you that long before God chose me and Kay to start this church, he already knew who my replacement would be. Before I even was born, and God formed me to plant this church and all these changed lives. God already knew who, um, who's going to replace me. So nothing surprises God. God never has to say oops or didn't see that coming or whatever. So uh, trust the sovereignty uh, of God. Okay. Expect mixed emotions. Okay. Number two, expect some people to leave our church family and some new people to join. Count on it. Now, why can I say that? Because that's always been the case, no matter what happens. That's always been the case in every church. You can't keep people who aren't committed to the family. And uh, it, it's a waste of time to do that. When I step down, there will be a few people, hopefully not many, who were Rick Warren groupies. They came just to hear me. Okay, then they never really were of us in the first place. But the people who are committed, not simply to me, but they're committed to our church family, they're going to stay. So expect some people to leave our church family. And what do you do? Love everybody. You love everybody. What you will find is that immature people leave immaturely. Mature people leave maturely. Loud people leave loudly. And quiet people lead quietly. So people lead when, when they leave, they are, they are revealing their character, not you. 
Don't take it as a personal affront. Don't take it as a rejection. Okay, uh, you know, they're going to go somewhere else. Fine. God, uh, for the last 42 years, I've been preaching to a parade. Hello, how are you? Goodbye. Hello, how are you? Goodbye. Hello, how are you? Goodbye. Literally tens of thousands of people have come through Saddleback over 41 and a half years. People leave for good reasons. They get married, they have a baby, they move to another place to get a promotion. They leave for bad reasons, wrong, wrong reasons. It, it doesn't matter. Uh, bottom line is you love everybody and uh, realize that new people will come in and while some, some leave, that's all. You can't keep people who aren't committed. So don't worry about it. A third thing to, to expect during this period of time, expect to be watched. I need to explain this to you. Expect to be watched. You might not realize it because sometimes you can't see the forest for the trees. But without a doubt, the most watched church in America is Saddleback Church. No other pastor in Saddleback and their retirement gets mentioned as it was this week in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the LA Times, CNN, NBC, USA Today, and on and on and on. The number of people, media, who've asked for an interview uh, is a long, long list. Uh, there is no church that's watched more than Saddleback Church. Uh, for right or wrong, good or bad, we have influence. And anything that happens in this church makes news. There's not any other church that if the pastor decided to resign or retire, retire, it's going to make it in the New York Times. Uh, so just realize that we are being watched and, and we want to be, this is an opportunity for us to show Christ likeness and love, um, uh, in, in spite of the fact that, uh, you know, it's it, nothing we do can be kept a secret. It, it's out there. Uh, it's already been on CNN. It's already been on NBC. It's already been on Fox, uh, because Saddleback has influenced so many other churches. Okay, number four. Okay, and I hate to ha I tell you this, but but you just count on it. Expect attacks. Expect attacks. There will be people who attack our church in this season. Uh, there will be there are Rick Warren haters, and there are mentally ill folks, and there are even Satan inspired critics who will use my um, uh, resignation or my stepping down or my retirement uh, as an excuse to attack our church. And they'll say, see, this is why, and, and here's, here's the point, they're going to attribute all kinds of motivation. I, I know this because I've seen it my entire life. We've never had any major decision at Saddleback Church that was an attack, misunderstood, uh, mislabeled, uh, wrong motivation attached to it, and, and all kinds of that. Just count on it, friends. There are kooky people out there. There are haters out there. There are folks who struggle with mental illness. There are all kinds of different people. It, it's it's going to come. I, I remember when Matthew died, when he took his life uh, due to his own mental illness. The meanness and the vitriol that came out, people attributing, they, they were, there were people who say, oh, Matthew was secretly a homosexual and his dad didn't approve of it. And so he took his life. Uh, there was, uh, Rick Warren was a terrible father and he beat his son. And so he took, his, they make up stories. They, they made up stories. When I was most hurting, they said the most vile, and mean-spirited. Even the newspapers saw this and came out saying the vitriol that's going against Kay Warren and Rick Warren right now in their death of their son, where people were these armchair critics and armchair psychologists and armchair attackers who from a distance will use anything to attack. So I'm telling you that there will be people, just count on it, there will be people who misread the 11 or 12 motivations that I just gave you and they're gonna make up something else. They, they, it, count on it, it will happen. So 
expect mixed emotions, expect some people leave the church, expect to be watched, expect attacks. And then finally, here's the good one. Expect the blessing and leadership of the Holy Spirit. Expect the blessing and the leadership of the Holy Spirit during this process. Now, I'm going to give you the verse that's going to be the theme verse for however long God calls Kay and me to stay in this position between now and whenever we step down uh, from the lead pastor role. And the theme verse between now and then is going to be Philippians 1 6. Philippians 1 6. Being confident, be confident of this that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. This church is far, far bigger than me. It's far bigger than Kay. It outgrew us like 41 years ago, okay? Uh, it, it, no single person could carry off what we do on a weekly basis. It's a team effort. It's a symphony. And if, if all of a sudden first chair trumpet's gone, well, you look for your replacement. And even if the conductor is gone, you still have the symphony. And this church is bigger than me. It always has been bigger than me. And it's bigger than you too. We serve God's purpose in our generation. That's it. We are better together. We are better together. It's not any individual. This is not a church of prima donnas. This is a church of a team. It's a church of a family. And family members grow old. Family members move away. Family members get married. Uh, family members die. But we're still a family. We're still a family. And, and so Philippians 1.6, I want you to memorize that verse. Be confident of this, that he who began a good work, the work that he began in the hearts of Kay and me before, back in 1979, that work, he will carry it on to completion. When? Until we retire? No, until the day of Jesus Christ. Until the day of Jesus. You are here, and I trust you in this transition. You, you need to realize that you're here at a significant turning point in our church. God wants to use you. God wants to use you for a smooth transition to the next generation. You've heard me say many times, the only thing that's going to last is the church. That a thousand years or 500 years from today, there, there won't be a Microsoft or an Apple or, or you know, Starbucks a thousand years today, there won't be a United States of America. No, no, no human built organization lasts. You know, where, where's the Roman Empire? Where are all the other empires that no longer exist? What, what, what will exist is the church. It's the only thing that's going to outlast. And guess what? It's going to outlast not just me. It's going to outlast you. The church for 2,000 years has been one generation handing the baton to the next, handing the baton to the next, handing the baton to the next. We are always, the church has always been one generation away from extinction. If we don't win the next generation, the Z's to Christ, and if Gen Z doesn't reach the generation after them to Christ, the church is always one generation away from extinction, but it's not going to happen. It's never going to go extinct. Why? Because Jesus said, I will build my church. So keep your eyes on Jesus, not on me, not on the critics, not on the attacks, not on all the people who are misinterpreting what we're trying to do. Uh, keep your eye on Jesus and realize that this is a bigger thing than you. You are investing your life in something that's going to outlast it. I have invested my life in something that's far going to outlast me. And when I get to heaven, I'm going to meet thousands of people who say, 
I'm in heaven because of Saddleback Church. Thank you. I want that to be true in your life. I'm asking, I'm calling for you to give your best for the bride of Christ in the days. I'm calling on you to give your best for the family of God called Saddleback. I'm calling on you. I'm admonishing you that I need you coming out of COVID to step it up. I need you to give more love, more prayer, more joy, more commitment, more time, more talent, more energy. Give, give, nothing you sacrifice for Christ is done in vain. Nothing you do for him will ever be wasted. We are at a pivotal point. And this is not the time to slack back and go, oh, Rick's leaving. What are we going to do now? Now's the time to redouble our effort to get ready for another phase of growth, to move not just into a new worship center in at Lake Forest, but to find a worship center for every one of our campuses. That's our task. That's our job. And, and to start new campuses and, and to continue reaching out. And you are here at this strategic time because obviously God knew you had the talents, you had the gifts, you had the abilities that were needed to get done what we needed to do. So I'm looking at you right now and I'm looking at your face and I'm going, will you step up? Will you say, I don't care who our senior pastor is. God has called me to this church. God has called me to this time. God has called me to this task. And the purposes of God will last forever. Many are the plans on a man's heart, but it is the Lord's purposes that are eternal. And as long as we build on his eternal purposes, God will keep blessing us. God will keep using us. So I just need you to say, I'm all in. Rick, you are handing us the baton. I'm not handing it to you when I leave. I'm handing it to you right now during this transition period. I'm handing it to you right now and say, will you step up? Whether I'm here for days or months or years or that is irrelevant to what God wants to do with you. Will you take the baton and go, you know what? I'm going to have the same time of commitment that Rick and Kay Warren had when they had nothing in this church. And now we have a huge church of really good, enriched soil. It is inevitable that we will have fruit. I believe in you. I trust you. I know this is the right time because I know you. I, 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 I know your commitment. I know your depth. I know your thing. And I feel absolute confident that if I were to drop dead today, and I'm not, I'm not going to drop dead. But if I were, that this church would go on and that our greatest days were ahead of us. Okay. Now you go, well, I'm, I'm no hero. You have no idea. You are a hero. You just don't realize it. You are a hero. The fact that you've helped us to get to where we are today, everybody doing their part makes the difference. And what I want is I want a staff that is so unified that whoever God calls to be the lead person, the lead pastor, that that person walks in and goes, this is an ideal situation. This is incredible. I'd give both arms to be pastor of this church. Now, it's 2.05 and I haven't even answered any of your questions. Guess what? We're going to have to do that in another session. <laughs> I'm sorry. I apologize. Forgive me for I have sinned. Uh, but we, I'll do another session. We'll just, but I wanted you to understand, most of all, why now and what to expect. Why now, what to expect. We'll do another staff meeting where I get into all of the, the gritty details. But I just want you, uh, I, I'm asking for your commitment to say, okay, guys, we're going to give it all. We're coming out of COVID. Uh, and we're all not back up at the full. I'm not asking for 100% of what you used to have. I'm asking for 100% of what you got right now. Okay? If you will give me all you've got of what you've got right now, guess what? God will take that. He'll divide it into multiple loaves and fishes. And, and we will uh, we'll feed the 5,000. And we'll, 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 we'll feed the world. All right. I'm going to pray for you. Let me pray. 
Uh, Lord, I love our staff. I love our team. I look at their faces and I just see not just potential. I see progress. I see development. I see maturity. I see people who have given their hearts to you and are committed not just to you, but are committed to this church family to make sure that the best of our days are the rest of our days, that the greatest days of Saddleback are ahead of us, that all the past was prologue, that it was all preparation, that the foundation has been laid, that the soil has been enriched so much, we're bound to have fruit. Help us to attempt great things for you and expect great things from you. Help us to move forward in confidence, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in us, you're not going to leave us. You're not going to drop us. You're going to continue it to the day of Jesus Christ. We pray that is true. We pray that promise is true, that Saddleback keeps growing and reaching and expanding and developing and winning and building and sending people out until the day you come back. And then one day we'll all go to heaven together and we'll celebrate all the changed lives that are going to happen in these future days ahead. Protect this staff, dear Lord. You know that I love them. You know that I pray for them every day. You, you know that I care and that I, I, I want you to protect their finances and protect their health and protect their relationships and protect their bodies, protect their minds so that they as women and men may be ministers of Jesus Christ for the glory of God and the growth of your kingdom. Fill us all with your Holy Spirit because we can't do this on our own. Without you, we are nothing. And I pray this blessing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.